Without further ado, we will go ahead and get started with our presentation. So today we are very fortunate to have presenters coming to us from East Tennessee Children's Hospital, um, all of whom work in the Grow With Me Clinic. We've got Caroline Milford, um, who received her bachelor's in science from the University of Tennessee and with a uh, major in human ecology and child development, and a master's degree from UT in social work as well. We've got Courtney Buchanan with us, who also UT grad, there's a bit of a theme going on here, um, and also got her master's in social work from UT. Uh, UT. And then we've got Dr. Corwin, um, Dr. Emily Corwin, uh, who is here with us today, who works at East Tennessee Children's Hospital, and she got her doctoral degree from uh, Louisiana State University, go Tigers, and she also, uh, she's trained in parent-child interaction therapy and trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. I think we're very fortunate to have them here presenting for us today. I think that their program is phenomenal, and I'm excited to have them share more information with you all about the Grow With Me Clinic. So without further ado, I'll let you all take it away. Good afternoon, I am Caroline and we're gonna get started um, with our presentation about Grow With Me and um, drug exposure. So I'm gonna start us off and then we're gonna have um, Courtney and Dr. Corwin kind of come in at their times. Okay, so I just wanted to start a little bit um, talking about what neonatal abstinence syndrome is, and then kind of um, just making sure everyone knows the difference in an NAS diagnosis versus an IUDE diagnosis. Um, there's a lot of confusion about that in the community, even in the medical um, setting. So I always like to um, kind of just let you know the differences in it. Um, <laughs> NAS, which is neonatal abstinence syndrome, is when our kiddos are exposed to um, any kind of drug in utero, whether it be prescribed um, or not prescribed, and they require medication in um, our NICU setting or a NICU setting after birth while they go through the withdrawal period. The difference in the IUDE, the interuterine drug exposure diagnosis, is these are the kiddos that have that same exposure in utero, but don't require the medication as they go through their withdrawal period. And I also just like to note that in Tennessee, NAS is a reportable diagnosis to the um, health department. So in our NICU or in any NICU um, or birth hospital, when a kiddo is born um, with this drug exposure, these are some of the things that we see um, the kids going through. Dr. Corwin will talk a little bit later about what these things look like as the kids get older, but when they are newborns, um, we have a scoring system that we use um, to score our kiddos that helps um, the providers determine when medication is necessary. Um, so some of the things we see are the, the really high-pitched crying. Um, some of the kiddos experience seizures. Some of them um, are just having tremors that may look like seizures, so they have to use um, their medical discretion to um, kind of decide um, which it is. Um, difficulty with their temperatures, diarrhea, difficulty sleeping, sneezing is one of the um, symptoms that we see, a lot of feeding difficulties, and sweating. So that's kind of what the kiddos look like in um, the NICU after they're born during their initial withdrawal period. So NAS is treated with pharmacological measures. Um, NAS is the diagnosis that you get when you're treated with the medication. The most common of those is morphine, clonidine, and phenobarbital. At Children's, we always start with morphine and then add the other medications on as needed. Um, some of our kiddos don't make it to having all three of them. And if you are getting the IUDE um, diagnosis, that is treated without pharmacological measures. And we use um, deep pressure, skin to skin, swaddling, just a lot of comfort measures. Um, we have cuddlers in the hospital that help with um, holding our kiddos, which they really enjoy during that period. I just put this slide on here just to show Tennessee is one that has one of the highest rates of NAS and it has just increased so much over the years. We, um, especially East Tennessee, it's very interesting that there is such a higher rate of NAS in East Tennessee than uh, Middle and West. 
we started to see a little bit of a decrease there for a few years. And then when COVID happened, it, it kind of spiked back up again. So I'm going to turn this over to Courtney now so that she can talk a little bit about the Grow With Me program, which was created five years ago in 2017 to help work with this population as these numbers were increasing. Hello. So now that Caroline kind of talked about which, you know, the patients that we serve, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our program and what we do. So we are a developmental follow-up program who we were specifically designed to kind of follow the developmental needs of these kiddos. So we track their development. We start, we do have some of our team members who see them here in the NICU and do some follow-up like our speech and OT. And then we start seeing them every three to four months um, to kind of track development. Um, we do all kinds of different things. We do lots of screeners. We um, are checking on not only their medical needs, but developmental, checking on emotional, and then checking on the family. Um, and then I think on the next page, yeah, this is all the members of our team. We have a social worker, which is Caroline and I, who we're really the main Grow With Me employees. We contact these families every month. We're really engaged with them, providing a lot of support, obviously, to the families, um, any caregivers, bio, biological caregivers, foster caregivers, anyone involved. We have a psychologist who you're going to hear from in a little while, Dr. Corwin. We have a registered dietitian who really helps keep track of that growth. Like Caroline mentioned, some of our kiddos have issues with feeding. Um, so our dietitian can kind of help track that growth and make sure it looks good and also help families as our kiddos get older with some of their sensory needs. They sometimes have difficulty with different types of foods and textures and kind of help make sure those families are prepared to kind of meet those needs accordingly. We have a speech therapist also um, who helps kind of track when they're infants, how their bottle feeding's going. Some of our kiddos have issues with, you know, breathing, sucking, swallowing, all that stuff at the same time. So they kind of help them with that and provide feedback. And they also um, will keep track of their actual speech development as they grow. Our occupational therapist is wonderful to kind of help a lot of our babies have sensory needs and they get either they need a lot of sensory input or they need very little sensory input. And that can be really hard to figure out for caregivers. So our occupational therapist is wonderful at figuring um, those things out and helping our team. And then we have a nurse practitioner as well. Um, all of our team is really dedicated to this specific population. They do screeners while the families are here to kind of make the determination. The main goal of the program is to screen these kiddos when they're here so that we can do referrals for early intervention so they can really get any needs they have met early on so they can do better long term. A lot of our kiddos before our program were having a really difficult time in the school system. So we're really trying to hope and to catch and support these families earlier. We also have a nursing staff that um, does a lot of helpful things. We also have a volunteer who is there. We give books and um, toys and things to families. So that is our team. And of course, when you think about Grow With Me, obviously the patient we're serving and their families are our first priority and who we're working with most directly. But you have to think, we also have to work with a lot of other people who are involved with this population, whether that be their primary care doctors, um, other specialists that we may refer to, um, you know, Department of Child Services, because a lot of our families have had all of them pretty much have had DCS involvement. And even if they're in foster care, that's a long process of transitioning care potentially or staying where they are and getting adopted. So we have to do a lot of hands on work with all of those things to kind of make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, and can follow and, and do what the child needs first and foremost. But if you aren't working with the family, you aren't gonna be able to help the child because obviously they need the support. They're pretty dependent on who's taking care of them. And this is um, our timeline of kind of when they come to see us. So we, like I said, we start in the NICU. Um, we have some of our team that sees them there. Um, and then our home health goes to see, we have nursing and social work. They go into the homes in the first um, couple of months of life to kind of make sure things are going well, settled in at home, doing, you know, making sure feeding's going well, checking weights, social work's making sure they don't have any needs for resources. And then our first visit is at about three or four months, three to four months. So 
they come to see us and we try to, we do the whole visit. A lot of things we're doing now um, at those first visits are like checking hepatitis C status. If their parents were positive and they were exposed, we do all of our developmental screeners, things like that, really try to set and get connected in that first appointment. And then we see them every three to four months from there um, until three, which we can start to graduate some if they're, um, ready for that. If they're doing really well, not needing any services, we can graduate, but we also can follow until five to really hopefully get them set up in as squared away as we can with school, um, their school plan, whether that be they went to early Head Start, they went to preschool, they're in services and need to get an IEP or anything like that before they actually start kindergarten. Um, so that's kind of our timeline of when we see patients. Are you gonna do something? I'm turning it back over to Carolyn. I wanted to add this slide because we get a lot of questions oh. from people in the community about how many um, families we serve, um, how many kids we see. Grow With Me began in March of 2017 with a two-year grant. Um, it was enough money for us to say, we're going to commit to this um, for two years. We use that money to pay staff. We use that money to buy all of our screening tools. Um, we give developmentally appropriate toys to our kiddos at our visits. So we use that money to pay for those things. We give gas cards to our families that have to travel far away. So we started the program and we were like, we got two years. Let's see what we can do. Let's see how this is going to go. And that was five years ago. So the first yearly numbers um, are how many patient visits we had in that year. And I just like to put that up just to show how much we're growing. Um, you know, there for a while, for a few years, the NAS numbers kind of started leveling out and we're looking pretty good. And we were really excited that Grow With Me was getting so, so big and so good because that meant we were connecting with the families out there that needed us without a, a you know, big increase in the babies being born. Um, so that's been really positive. Courtney mentioned um, when she talked about that timeline, how we start in the NICU, which is, um, the majority of our kiddos do start in our NICU here, but in these five years of the program, we have worked really hard to connect with the community. Um, and so you don't have to be a, a newborn baby that went through a children's NICU to be a part of our program. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, at the end about getting into the program, but you don't have to start there, but um, that's where the majority start. So those numbers are just to show that Grow With Me is growing. So that grant ran out and we, you know, felt like we were doing so much good work for these families, so much good work for this population, and we just couldn't stop. So um, we continue to be a grant funded program. We continue to search for grant money all the time. We, we apply for grants um, often um, because we just continue to grow. And at this point, there's just no way we can stop. So. We have um, about 500, I think when I counted the last, it was about 518 families enrolled in our program currently right now. Um, and the numbers um, for each month just shows how many patient visits we had um, each month. We um, see, we have Grow With Me Clinic every single Tuesday of the month, except for one Tuesday in December around Christmas. So 51 out of 52 weeks of the year we are doing Grow With Me. We have a little video to show you guys. Dr. Caleb Corwin, I think, is going to um, put this up for us. Grow With Me um, made this video to thank some of our donors during COVID when they weren't allowed to come into the hospital and kind of see our clinic. We really, when we have donors, we really like to show them what the clinic looks like and kind of the population that we're serving. And so we made this video. So I thought it would be nice to share with you guys just so you could get a little bit more of a glimpse into an actual clinic visit. They have helped us in so many ways. Hello. Hey. They're incredible. How are you all? If Tilitha Sampson reflects all the love she's received. Kick it. Good job. And the two-year-old is a shining star. She's doing really good. And for her mother, Ashley. Like mommy does, watch. Knowing love at East Tennessee Children's Hospital's Grow With Me Clinic has made all of the difference. Well, they all teach you different things and I'm, I thank them for everything because they've taught me, you know, how to get my little girl to do new things and eat better food. The clinic helps children up to five years old who have been treated for neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS. NAS happens when babies are in contact with medications or illegal drugs in the womb. After they're born, 
They experience withdrawal just like adults. Put it on top. Children, like Tilitha. Good job. Yay! Who see a team of experts, including psychologists, dietitians, occupational and speech language therapists, a nurse practitioner, and social workers. Their goal is to ensure children with NAS are meeting their developmental milestones. I love how each one comes in and talks to you, and they really put it where you can understand it. That clarity is key because the situation can be complicated. Mothers with babies diagnosed with NAS often feel guilty. Their drug use causes their babies to go through that withdrawal, which can be painful. Children's Hospital is a non-judgmental environment focused on the child and family unit, which makes everyone well. Uh, sadness, because when I was going through it, you know, I felt really bad seeing my little one lay there, you know, going through withdrawal. But through Children's Hospital and the clinic, Sampson has kept a positive attitude. It is a sad thing, but hey, they're here to help you and, you know, just pray to God, keep your head up, and it's going to be okay. And that's why program coordinator Caroline Milford does what she does. It's um, why we designed the clinic to start with the moms or the caregivers in the NICU, just really forming that bond, um, creating that relationship, building rapport, um, letting them know that they can trust us. That trust helps lift caregivers up from what can be a low time in life. People ask me all the time, how do you do that? Don't you just get so mad? Aren't you so angry? Don't you get tired of it? And I just, I don't view these women like that. I don't view them as, um, I don't know, a problem, an issue, a, a hindrance. Say hello, Aunt Daisy. Who's up that phone? They are a person to me that has most likely been through so much in their lives. Like everything they've been through has led them to where they are now. And I think that's a huge piece of who they are and what we want to do with our program. A program that Samson credits with saving her daughter's life. I am hoping that she will, you know, grow up and just be the best that she can. And I'm going to tell her about mommy's life and let her know, you know, don't go down the path that mommy went through because it's a very sad thing. And you don't want to see your baby laying like that, you know, having to get doses of medicine to help it. So I hope she does better in life and hopefully I can teach her and tell her my mistakes and she'll learn from mommy and do better. Okay, so just a little bit about how to get into Grow With Me. You can start out in our NICU, but we accept um, referrals anywhere um, from anyone. And like I said, in the past five years, we've worked really hard to connect with pediatricians, to connect with um, the court system, to connect with um, TEIS, some of the birth hospitals. We get referrals from a lot of different places. Sometimes we get self-referrals. We get parents that call us and say, hey, I have a friend who is in your program or I've heard of this, um, can I get in? Um, so really our only um, requirements right now are that you, the kids obviously have to have drug exposure in utero and then we like for them to be 35 weeks gestation or um, more. If they are under that, we send them to a different medical specialist for their prematurity and for their drug exposure. So that's really our only um, requirements. We try to keep our kiddos obviously um, under five, since that's when we um, planned a discharge, but um, we we have taken recently some, some much older children that really just need to get some services started and get some education so that they can continue on. We do have a specific referral form, which I can share that can be faxed into us, um, but just a phone call or an email is also a very fine way to get a referral started for a kiddo for Grow With Me. And then just a couple of new things coming. Um, our OGs, our original kiddos that we started Grow With Me With are starting, most of them are starting kindergarten in the fall. Um, we're really excited about that. Um, sad to, to kind of have to let go of them a little bit, but excited to see how that goes. Um, we've worked really hard with these families on making sure these kiddos have a really good school plan. Um, Courtney mentioned earlier, we push really hard for them to let us help them get into Head Start to voluntary preschool, um, some kind of a preschool program. Uh, most of our kiddos have already, these, the, our five-year-olds have already had a child find assessment to see if they qualify for any services in the school system. Um, 
lots of them have gotten IEP plans and we've been really helpful with the families in um, kind of taking their needs to the school system and advocating for what they need. And we are also working to start um, doing some remote clinics. Um, right now, like I said, we have clinic every single Tuesday um, of the year, except for one here at our hospital, the downtown location. And we are in the works to start a clinic um, in our Sevierville location. And then um, we hope to grow that um, to go out to other locations um, to kind of capture our families that aren't able to get here um, and make it easier on them. So kind of some new things that we're working on. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Emily Corwin for the second half. Okay, let me get this set up a little bit. All right, um, so I am gonna be talking about some long-term outcomes and some clinical considerations just to keep in mind um, as we're working with these kiddos as they get older. Um, I, so I've been practicing for close to 10 years. So I'm sure I've been working with young kids, right? So I, 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 I feel like I'm kind of, my specialty area is with young kids. So um, kind of birth to age five or so. Um, and so I've been working with this population for a long time. So I'm sure I've come into contact with many more kids with NAS than I'm even aware of, or kids with a history of NAS. Um, but I was able to look through the past two years of my kind of patient uh, like caseload, and I, I was able to identify about 20 that I've seen over the last couple of years um, that have a history of NAS or in utero drug exposure. Um, and that some of those, the very small portion of those had the benefit of going through the Grow With Me clinic. Uh, most of them came to me later, like it may be age four or age five, um, just with behavioral concerns. Um, so um, that's kind of, that's where I'm drawing from my, uh, from the presentation today is kind of mostly on my clinical experience because of this. Um, there we go. Um, so as I was researching for this presentation, um, this is kind of like, in a nutshell, what every article said. Uh, the long-term neurodevelopmental side effects of NAS are yet to be fully explored. Um, I think this is, for a lot of reasons, this is a relatively new issue, um, right? So opioids were just developed in the 90s, and so we've only had a relatively short period of time to see the outcome of opioids. And I mean, other drugs have been around for much longer, but um, obviously, uh, but that, that this specific concern of in utero drug exposure is relatively new um, and widespread, right? So I think that, um, but also there's just, there are clinics like this that exist, but lots of times they're clinical in nature. And so we're not doing the research that would inform, uh, you know, treatment. Um, so I think it's, it's tricky. So I, I will kind of go through in this presentation what we know and what we found in the research, um, but a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is just based on my clinical experience. So I wanted to put that caveat out there just from the very beginning. Okay, so some areas that we know um, and that we feel pretty confident that we're going to see impairment in when we're talking about kids who have a history of NAS or IUDE. Um, so this list here, so uh, there was a meta-analysis that showed some clear deficits in areas of cognitive ability, psychomotor performance, and behavioral outcomes. So just kind of overall, one meta-analysis found that. Um, another study identified some deficits in short-term memory. Um, so I don't know, I can't speak whether or not they looked at long-term memory or looked at both and just found deficits in short-term memory, but they were able to, to identify that kids who have this history are more likely to struggle with short-term memory um, and inhibition. Um, we also have found that there are significantly lower scores on executive, all executive functioning scales. Um, I want to note on that, so the scores in this particular article were significantly lower than uh, peers who don't have have exposure in their history, but they still fell within a normal range. So I found that to be very hopeful um, and something that I wanted to mention specifically. Um, it, talking about behavior kind of in more detail, so one study about half of kids with, um, 
with NAS had a diagnosable mental disorder, mental health disorder by age five. Um, and that's compared to, yeah, that's compared to th about 30% of kids um, who don't have that same history. Um, and then compared with other births, kids born with NAS are over twice as likely to have disturbance of conduct, ADHD, adjustment reaction, and intellectual disability. Um, so those are some some kind of details in the area of, of behavioral deficits and behavioral concerns. And um, one study said that NAS is a marker for high levels um, of risk of psychiatric conditions in early childhood. So um, we can feel pretty confident that these kids are more likely to have behavioral and mental health concerns. Um, I want to just <laughs> highlight um, that the list before you uh, really, really reflects um, and kind of captures ADHD as a diagnosis, uh, right? And so um, ADHD, based on the research, right, like I'm kind of making some connections here, but also based on my experience, ADHD is the biggest concern that I have when I know a child has a history of NAS. Um, they're also, these kids are more likely um, and more at risk for um, experiencing child abuse and neglect. So that's something that we as practitioners should be aware of um, and should have on our radar. Um, they also have a risk, a higher risk of future drug use themselves. Um, I think there's a lot of factors playing into this and that could probably be its own presentation at another time, right? Um, but I, when I'm working with young kids, obviously I'm not seeing drug use in a five-year-old, right? Hopefully, Ooh, that would be rough. Um, but what I am seeing in these kids, um, and this again, this is clinical experience. This is not necessarily founded in the, found in the research yet. Um, but I'm seeing kids with, um, especially when it comes to screens, screen time, TV, cell phone, tablet, all of those fun things for, you know, for humans, um, they're, sh they're showing kind of um, a harder time separating from screens and kind of more impact on behavior when they're exposed to screens. Um, and to me, that that play, you know, like we're more and more kind of thinking that we can kind of be addicted to screens, right? And so that idea of addiction, I'm not seeing kids drug addicted at age five, but I am seeing kids possibly like I'm concerned about their relationship with screens. So that's something that we can kind of apply and kind of titrate down to the age group that we're kind of talking about here. And something to consider. Um, all right. So we have some information on the um, impact of education on, on education as well. Um, there are a couple of studies that looked at education specifically. Um, kids with NAS are more likely to be referred for a disability evaluation at school, to meet criteria for an educational disability and to require classroom therapies and services. Um, we're also seeing that there are some deficits in learning and that that deficit is progressive over time. Um, so uh, one article stated just really painfully, NAS is strongly associated with poor and deteriorate, deteriorating school performance. Um, so what, what, we, what we notice is that, um, or what we've kind of seen in the research is that test scores are significantly lower than same age peers by grade three and then by grade seven, kids with a, with a history of NAS scored lower than other children in age five, in, in grade five. So we're seeing that like, so at, in third grade, they're lower than their same age peers, but by grade seven, they're lower than the kids two grades behind them. Um, so we're seeing some, uh, some real challenges in school that I think we, we don't even know about yet. <laughs> you know, like we haven't, we don't have the research to show us or tell us. So uh, this is something that is probably actively being discussed in school systems, um, especially in this part of the country, if I had to guess. I wanna be really clear. So this is all, this is correlation. This is not causation. Um, we, there are lots of environmental factors that have to be considered and that cannot be teased out. Um, so we would never, I would never encourage this, but I just wanna say clearly like, we don't have the information that we would have from a research study that said like, all right, mom, here, you take these opioids and this mom don't take these opioids and let's see what happens, right? Like we're never gonna do that. We don't want to, to do that, but that's the level of research, research that we would need to be able to say like drugs cause these outcomes, right? And we don't have that. Um, so some of the confounding um, 
uh, factors that were noted in the research articles that I reviewed. Um, there were you know, concerns or questions about the quality of caregiving, quality of parenting, um, and this population of kiddos. Um, that noted and probably fairly so, frequent maternal absenteeism um, in this population. There were some questions raised about maternal education level and parental employment rate. And those, those things all play into kid behavior, right? Um, and to kid functioning. And so they're things that I don't think can be ignored um, and are certainly a part of um, many of, of these kids with this history, many of their worlds. Um, also, um, we can't tease out substance, or we don't often tease, tease out substance exposure. Um, so it's rare to tease out the type of drug used during pregnancy. So lots of times we just have in utero drug exposure or neonatal abstinence syndrome, right? But that doesn't tell us anything really about the drugs that were used. Um, and we don't often have that information. It's also rare to tease out poly substance abuse, right? So we're not necessarily looking at the difference between uh, babies who are exposed only to Suboxone prescribed by a doctor, right, in pregnancy versus kids who are exposed to heroin and maybe Suboxone and uh, marijuana and alcohol, right, all those other um, substances where it, we don't have that level of information. Um, so it's, it's hard to know kind of the level of concern based on what drug the child was exposed to or how many drugs. Um, okay, so now I'm going to get, ooh, I need to slow down. Um, I'm going to get into my clinical experience here with these kiddos. Um, I, yeah, so I think I, I said this earlier. So in the last couple of years, I've seen about 20 of these kids um, that I know of in my outpatient and the outpatient world uh, where I spend part of each week. Um, and so, and these next few slides, I'm just going to kind of touch on some trends that I've noticed. Um, these are, um, it's not research, right? This is just my clinical experience. And these are just things that I've noticed. And they're not even in every, so it's a small population, right? About 20 kids. And they're not, these things are not even seen in every child, right? So I want to be really clear and cautious and saying like, this is not every kid with NAS. Um, these are just things to kind of be aware of when you know that the child in front of you has a history of drug exposure in utero. Um, and they've cropped up for me with it within this population. Okay, so sleep came to mind immediately. And this is something we see in kids, um, um, we see in kids early, right? So it was one of the things that Caroline mentioned in the NICU, uh, we see kids with uh, having a hard time sleeping, right? And this seems to kind of carry on throughout childhood. Um, so what I've heard from families is really short interrupted sleep um, in this population often, um, low sweet sleep quality, so lots of tossing and turning, just even if they're asleep, parents are describing like they just never seem to be still. Um, so just moving all throughout the night. Um, um, it, like flipping sides of the bed, you know, like getting like tangled up in their sheets, that, that type of sleep um, and early wakening. Um, and I'm talking about, so when I'm working with, um, with a family whose parents come in and say like, God, they wake up at like 5 a.m. 5 a.m. is my limit where I say, sorry, y'all, as uncomfortable as it is, five o'clock is an appropriate wake time for a human being. Um, and so, but kids, but the kids that are coming in with a history of NAS and concerns with sleep are waking up before 5 a.m. So to, I mean, like I even have to admit that that's not okay, right? And we've got to work on it or do something about it. Um, also lots of concerns with not being able to fall asleep initially at night and not being able to stay asleep throughout the night. So waking up a lot throughout the night. So those are the, um, and again, I hear these things from kids who don't have this history also. Like this is not unique to NAS. It just seems to be more frequent um, and it seems to be kind of more intense in this population. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit on each of these slides about how I kind of approach it. Um, and kind of my attitude towards these, these difficulties because it's different. Um, when I know a kid has a history of NAS, my, my approach and my plan is often a little bit different. Um, 
So I do obviously initially want to ensure that we have good sleep hygiene, right? Like let's set these kids up for success as much as we can. Um, and oftentimes that means um, turning on a sound machine, right? Or a box, aid, like something that's gonna make steady, constant noise throughout the night. Um, and that can help. Uh, so uh, good, um, have it, background noise is important. Um, white noise, you know, white noise, something that's steady. Um, making sure that the, the environment is cool and dark. We sleep better uh, when the environment is cool and dark. Um, making sure that they've got, you know, covers, right? We, we all sleep better when we're covered up, even if it's with just a sheet. Um, sometimes it's talking about, and the younger kids is talking about addition of a sleep sack. Um, and older kids, sometimes we get into sensory stuff, like those, like, they're like body, socks or something right so like they kind of like give you a little squeeze sometimes that is important to consider with this population um making sure they're not having caffeine before bed um or really throughout the day uh, making sure that we're separating screen time from going to bed right those so good sleep hygiene i want to make sure that's all in place um sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't but i will also say sometimes it doesn't matter, right? So I think with kid, typically developing kids who don't have this history, that's where I'm, I'm gonna hit hard and I'm gonna push for those areas. Um, kids with NAS, I'm gonna push hard. I need for that to be the case, but it just seems less likely to help in kids who have a history of NAS. Um, so with these kids, I am um, much quicker to refer to a like a sleep specialist or a psychiatrist or a PCP, somebody who can prescribe some medication to help with this. Um, that's usually my last resort. I don't like the idea of medication for sleep. It feels like a band-aid that we're never going to be able to take off. Um, but for kids who have a history of NAS, I'm, I'm just more likely to go that direction. I'm also talking with families a lot more about acceptance, right? So talking about um, this is this kid. This is the kid you have. He doesn't sleep well. There are things we can do to help him sleep better, but he might always have a hard time sleeping. Um, and so how do we make it work for him and how do we make it work for y'all? Uh, so definitely taking more of an acceptance approach rather than uh, focusing so much on intervention because sometimes it's just it just feels unchangeable. Um, so that's sleep. Uh, I've mentioned this already. So ADHD symptoms, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide. Uh, we went through all of the areas of ADHD um, symptoms that we know these kids are, are prone to. Um, I will say some of the kids who come in with a history of NAS that I see who um, have ADHD, it's it's more intense and more severe um, than your typical, well, maybe it's not a typical kid, but your kid who doesn't also have a history of NAS, right? Um, so these are kids who, um, it's just really impairing. Um, it's getting in the way of everyday life from a very young age. So the two kind of considerations that I have um, when I know a kid has a history of NAS and they're coming with ADHD concerns, I'm more likely to diagnose a little bit earlier um, I draw a really hard line. Um, usually, I won't diagnose ADHD before age five, um, as pretty much a general rule. If I have a kiddo who's coming in um, with a history of NAS, I'm more likely to, more likely to diagnose at age four, and I can think of one time I've diagnosed at age three. So, like, I still like, I don't want to go too young because that doesn't feel right to me at all. But I just have to. I, I'm just much more aware of the impact on functioning that these symptoms are having for these kids. So I'm more likely more likely to diagnose maybe a little bit earlier. I'm also much more likely to refer to psychiatry um, and much quicker to refer to psychiatry uh, for med management. Um, because again, just like we talked about with sleep, the behavioral strategies that I'm going to offer, we're going to do, we're going to talk about all of it and try to make sure we've got a good plan in place. Um, it seems like these kiddos respond a little bit less easily and less um, quickly to behavioral strategies. Seems like um, they need a little more time um, and medication can really, really help. Um, emotional dysregulation. I, this again, this is just a, 
uh, something I've noticed in these kiddos, it seems like they're very, very quick to emotion. So not just, so certainly anger and frustration, we see those a lot, but also like super quick to excitement and um, just those big emotions and very quick to get there. Um, and they're often just very intense emotions for these kids. So I have not necessarily yet, maybe for a couple of five-year-olds, I've worked a little bit, like five minutes a session and the rest of the session would be focused on the parents and how we're managing it. But maybe like five or so minutes a session working on emotion identification and coping strategies, right? And really also working with the parents on helping the kids use um, coping um, and appropriate adaptive coping strategies, right? Um, so I do think as these kids age, if I continue to see them, right? I, right now, I mean, I don't know, I couldn't tell, I don't think I have many on my caseload who are older than about five to seven. Um, but as they get older, I could see them benefiting from something like cognitive behavioral therapy, or maybe, maybe not benefit, I don't know, just like everything else, it seems like it's harder with this population, um, but it might be a good treatment option for older kids as they get older, right? Because they do seem to have those big intense emotions often. Um, and then finally, so safety concerns. We, this is some, there's been a couple, and this has been recently over the last six months or so, a couple of kiddos who have come in with just really dangerous behaviors um, and with a history of NAS, obviously. Um, this often seems to be related to sensory seeking. Um, I had a family who, there was a, there was a little girl, so I'm going to tell you about two families. So both little girls. So one had um, a desire and just a, an impulse to smell and taste big tastes and big flavors, um, which can be fine, right? Like we can absolutely offer big, you know, big tastes in our meals and those types of things. And I, and I encourage that family too. Um, but it was turning into a safety concern in that she was like smelling and tasting feces, right? Because it was the, the sensory experience was just incredible for her. Um, and she kind of couldn't get enough. Um, and so that was, that was one concern that really came up that stood out to me as a safety issue. Another, I had a family come in who, um, the parents were afraid to, to tell this child what would happen if she ran out into the, like what was dangerous about running out into the road, okay? Because she wanted pressure all the time. She wanted deep pressure. She wanted to just always be touched and always just like the tightest, hardest pressure that she could possibly get. She was seeking it all the time. And this mom was afraid that by telling her, if you run into the road, you might get hit by a car that the little girl would say like, oh, that sounds so good, right? Which is a safety concern. We had to absolutely problem solve, like how are we gonna talk about this? How are we gonna keep this kid safe? Um, because this mom was just, and I, I don't know, like this is, I don't know what this child would have done with that information, but um, the mom was convinced she would have just wanted that input. And so would have chosen to run into the room, like it wouldn't have been a deterrent. Um, so we've got to just be, just be aware of those safety issues, offer environmental um, modifications when needed. How do, we, how do we keep kids from running into the street, right? Let's do everything we can to stop it from even being an issue. Um, and then making sure that we are uh, reinforcing appropriate behavior, right? Um, it, it, it's, hard, it, it's hard to work on because it is a safety concern and it's, it's scary as a clinician. Um, but, um, but it's there and I would be I would be remiss if I didn't put it on y'all's radar because it's definitely something that's come up a handful of time, times. Um, okay, so some therapies to consider. I've definitely used parent-child interaction therapy with this population. Sometimes kids remember trauma, right? If they, or are actively, you know, in a difficult environment. Um, and so lots of times TFCBT is an appropriate therapy. Um, I think behavioral parent training, uh, like that phrase is out of vogue right now. Like I don't think, and I don't like it, it sounds pejorative, um, but behavioral parent training or caregiver collaboration, right? Let's work together to come up with a plan uh, to keep this kid safe, I think is very appropriate and probably what I do the most with these families. Um, child parent psychotherapy came up as a, as a possible good treatment option as well. Um, so those are kind of the manualized type or uh, theoretically based therapies um, that, I, that I would recommend and that I use myself. Um, again, I'm also much quicker 
to refer for medication, to refer to psychiatry or um, PCP, get started with PCP to kind of see where, where they could go next if the PCP is not comfortable managing these types of medications. Um, and I do think, and this is kind of wrapping it all together, right? Going back to the Grow With Me conversation, I think these kids need more wraparound services. Um, as much as we can get a team of people working with these kids, I think that that is the most appropriate thing. Um, so those are my references. And then I think that's it. So for questions. We need a teenage girl with me, Caroline just said. <laughs> I think we might. I'm going to scoot this back so it's not me. The screen. I haven't been looking at the chat at all, so I don't know if we have had questions. I guess I could do that. You're, you're good. Okay. We've, we've been monitoring for you. Yeah. Thanks. So feel free to type in the chat or unmute yourself yep. if anybody has any questions. I was wondering, uh, I, I just had a question. I know um, you had mentioned one of the ways would be to email y'all or to fill out a referral form. Could, could you type in the chat the email address that people could send an email to if they had a kiddo who was appropriate? Definitely. Awesome. And if you're able to, if you want to send me um, that referral form, I could email it out to everybody who's here today. Um, I'll definitely do that. Later. Oh, and there's a question in the chat um, from Leslie. Um, is the Grow With Me program free? Yes, good question. Um, yes, um, so we're grant funded. We um, do bill insurance um, for a very small piece. So for our 10 care children, which is um, the majority, vast, vast majority of our kiddos, probably 98% of our kids are um, 10 care, they pay nothing um, for Grow With Me. We do have a few kiddos um, that are on private insurance. Those do have co-pays um, and the families are aware of that. So they can choose if they want to come do a payment plan, um, that kind of thing. We're able to talk to them about that um, ahead of time, but very rare that um, anyone has any form of copay when they come. And for our biological parents bringing our kids to grow with me, so they're not getting any kind of financial assistance, you know, through foster care or anything like that, we give them um, gas cards every time they come to help with transportation. Another question in the chat is, uh, any thoughts on what is causing the significant uptick in kids, uh, in kids born exposed in East Tennessee? COVID hasn't helped. Um, we also have a lot of um, prescribers. We have a lot of um, doctors in the area who prescribe the Subutex and Suboxone and Methadone. And I'm not going to go, I'm not saying that that is wrong. Um, but I will say that there's sort of a disconnect. Um, it appears in East Tennessee with our prescribers and the effects afterwards. Um, a lot of our, our mothers are sobbing in the NICU saying, I was told this wouldn't happen. I was told if I took this medication, my kid would be fine. Um, that's why I did this um, kind of thing. So I think that there's just kind of a, like Emily said, that huge lack of um, long-term research that we're needing to help educate um, prescribers and parents um, of the risk of even the prescribed medication. And I think with a connection to like COVID and an uptick, obviously COVID was stressful for a number of reasons. These people lost their jobs. Kids were home more. Parents were more stressed out. Um, there has been some changes and some, you know, prescribed medications can be harder to get. So we're going more outside and getting it non-prescribed. So I think we're seeing more of multiple different types of drug use. So I think if you think just adding stress onto an already low income, low resource population, then you see an uptick in relapse or just different things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's another question in the chat from Jenna uh, Carter. Are there any programs you would suggest referring children above age five and preteens if they if they're needing support and have the NAS history programs I don't know of any programs um kind of like I said before so that behavioral the collaborative collaborative caregiving right so working with the, the family to come up with a good plan so therapy right um and as they get older I think probably CBT strategies would be helpful but I don't know of any programs for older kids 
Yeah, when we get that question for kids that they want to refer to the program that are older and don't meet criteria or siblings, you know, we'll be seeing a kiddo and they have an older sibling, we definitely are, are always recommending um, some form of therapy through a professional in the area. But as far as a program goes, I don't know of any program like multidisciplinary that would serve those kids. There's not very many programs even for this younger population. There's only, we're, one, we're the only one in this area we were based off one in Florida, right? Mm -hmm. There's not very many, so um, definitely not for older. And I, I imagine it's much the same strategy, right? But just taking older, that they probably are going to have multiple professionals involved. You know, you're probably going to have older kids still in OT and meeting OT, as well as that just that heavy behavioral component and potentially psychiatry more frequently than you might for other kids. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's another question. Is there education for parents around establishing an IEP? Yes, around an IEP, is that what you said? Yes. Yes, there is a program in Tennessee called STEP, um, and it is a free program where these professional women um, that created the program literally teach you how to navigate the school system with IEP and um, child find and 504 plans. I can actually email you some dates. There's going to be some um, sessions at our West Rehab Center coming up um, for families that need help navigating that system. Um, the, the women that develop stuff are going to be there um, a couple of nights a week and giving out that information. That is probably the best program for that. Yeah, and I, I totally second that recommendation. I'm a huge fan of STEP. I put the web address in the chat for anybody who wants to access that. And again, it's free. And Beth Smith is our local rep and she's super helpful. Or at least she's the one I've had most contact with. Uh, there's another question. What special education certification would these kids qualify for? Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> it's like, it's like, but it totally depends, right? So like these kids have deficits in so many areas that it could be any of the of the IDA categories, right? Um, the one that comes to mind is probably the one that is less is least used, which is that emotion is it emotional disturbance, emotional yeah, behavioral indeed. disturbance, yeah. um, would be the probably, you know, the kids that, that are coming to mind when I think of this population, they might qualify there. But I know that one's not used a ton or it hasn't been historically. I, I would also guess like other health impaired, ADHD, yeah. right? Yeah, there. Mm -hmm. And other health impaired. Yeah. Yeah, the school system's not really designed um, to identify our kiddos um, at all. And so we really focus in the last, especially the last year of enrollment and grow with me with helping the families advocate to let the school system know what they need, what kind of language to use, what's the best um, kind of way to go about that. But that is a really, really big barrier for our kiddos in school is, is finding the ability to meet the um criteria for the things that they need with their diagnosis. I, I have a question for Dr. Corwin about ADHD mm -hmm. um, treatment in these kids. Do we know anything about how well they respond to the traditional pharmacological treatment? I don't, I, I don't know research on that. I'm, I, didn't look specifically. So I, it's possible there's something out there. Um, in my clinical experience, um, yeah. It's been hit or miss. So like sometimes they do really, really great on a stimulant, but sometimes like I, I'm thinking of one kid right now who they've tried every stimulant and it caused significant aggression. It caused some uncomfortable so sexual kind of behaviors. Um, and so now they're, they've moved on to the non-stimulants and it was it. So hit or miss, it's, it doesn't seem to be as like spot on as it is for a lot of kids with ADHD. Right, right. I imagine there's not a lot out there because just wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, or if there are later, feel free to email. Um, and we can pass those questions along. But I just want to take it and really thank each of you so much for this presentation today. It's really helpful. I, I, I really appreciate the work you're doing in our community. I mean, we have unfortunately way too many kids <laughs> experiencing this. And so I'm so happy to know about the service you provided. And I thank you for talking to us about what you do and how to connect kids to that service. So. Thank you so much for that today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just a reminder to everybody, we're, we're going to post this, um, a video of this on our YouTube channel. So if you have colleagues who want to watch this, you, um, you can send them a link later on once we have that.
There is a survey, in, uh, a link to a survey in the chat. So for each of you who attended, please complete that survey and give us feedback on how you feel like it's going, how it went today, other suggestions you have also. That link after you complete the survey, that's how you're going to get your certificate for completion today. So that will be um, be there after you complete complete your survey. And the other thing I wanted to remind you of is that uh, next month, we on August, we're going to have a presentation. We're going to have um, Reina Zakaria from the Community Coalition Against Human Trafficking come and give us a talk about recognizing and responding to human trafficking, which I think is going to be uh, an excellent presentation as well. So thank you all again for, for coming and thank you guys for presenting. All right. Hope everybody enjoys your weekend.